Um, I think I should start out with a little disclaimer here today, <laughs> um, because we've already heard a lot about open data and open access and the politics behind it and the risk assessment of it. And what I'd like to talk about today is is not so much should you put your data out there or shouldn't you and, and things like that. It's more once you have put your data out there, you have made it available on the internet. What how can you make it more accessible for people like me, who are researchers who want to access the data and want to use it, reuse it in different applications in my own research? Um, and at this point, I should also just say that I'm not coming from some big heritage data uh, institution. I'm just me as a private researcher. Well, I work for the project that I work for, but. Um, so, from my point of view, as a lone researcher, how do I get more out of all this data that we have on the Anyway, um, let's see if this works. So, currently, I'm working as a digital humanist and programmer at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich on the Buddhist manuscripts of Gandhara project. And uh, I'd like to begin the presentation today with a little dialogue that actually starts in a way that many of us are possibly familiar with this um, phrase. Is there anyone here? Okay. So here goes. It's a little dialogue between me and the world. Hello world. Hello you. Now why don't... Oh, that doesn't really work quite well. Why don't I put my data online and share it with you world? Great idea you. I will of course do the same. <laughs> anyway. That's quite me. But um, the question is, and this question my title, can we share? Uh, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Uh, can we share? Well, I'm not quite sure that we are there yet. So this is why I propose this, uh, this rhetorical question. And what I mean by share is, can I actually get access to your data in... No, it's not really. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, we want to share, or at least this is what we write in our funding applications. We want to share and we want to make our data available to the whole world. Um, but are we actually share enabled yet? Um, it's just, as a researcher, I would like to, um, it's just not enough for me that I'm, I can go to your website and I can search through your data set, but I can't actually access it. I can't get it out in a format that I, I can use for anything. I can't get it out uh, necessarily as something as simple as a, a common separated versioning file or even something I'd really like to get is like a flexible web service, so access through a URL. Uh, I know today we've had some presentations showing all these neat things you can, you can, well you can access it like that. Um, I think what I'm looking at is more it's not so much sharing between big institutions and, and things like that, but how do we make this available to the lone researcher? So, in 2007, I researched data retrievability as part of my MSc dissertation, which is called Heritage Portals and Cross Data, Cross Border Data Interoperability. And my conclusion back then was already it could be better. Um, as a, a quote from the the dissertation. Other heritage pools have been demonstrated throughout the dissertation, coming to the conclusion that the most that most of them provide read-only access to users, even though the technology with which they were built could potentially allow more open access. But this is of course a few years ago, so I was hoping to um, to follow this up with a little research example. 
and it's very traditional research of a hypothesis and a test and a conclusion. Where's that screen? Okay. Um, so for the test, I've chosen the subject of a poster. And um, this is simply because actually I, I once found a poster and I really, I really like them. And um, so I decided to, to kind of go on the internet, very basic, look at what is a poster, how can I find information about a poster, and if this is what I wanted to research. So I'm just quickly introduce poster up to you. It's a bronze axe or chisel. And it can look like this. Um, actually, at the time where I found it, uh, in a field somewhere in Britain, I was already very much into data. So uh, I was probably one of the few people on the project who wasn't really in archaeology for the gold or the bronze or things like that. So I was a bit, okay, I found this poster and everyone was really <laughs> jealous and I was like, but it's like data, you know. <laughs> but anyway, it's... So, anyway, it's very common in the mid bronze age in northern, western and southwestern Europe. Yes, I did look this fact up on Wikipedia because I couldn't be bothered to go through my own old notes. So what do I do with this information? Um, I, I, the first thing I wanted to do was to try and find out more about the spread of posters. So I wanted to map data. So I decided to go looking for map data. Um, and I went to the wonderful Portable Antiquities scheme where I could do a search, I could um, find a lot of pole stamps across Britain. And the best thing about this is that if I signed up with them as a researcher, told them what I wanted to research and why, they said, okay, we'll give you access to the data. We'll give you a uh, KML um, export of the data so that you can open it up, you can maps or whatever you want to do. We'll give you a CSV export too. And I really, I found this approach quite inspiring. I'm going to use it later on in my own um, work. So, so I got, from the uh, Portable Antiquity Scheme, I found uh, 335 results for the object type equals poster. And then I headed off to Sweden to look at their uh, FMIS sponsor, their Citing Monuments Register. And here I find, found 35 mentions of Afsats Uksa, which is switch poster. Um, and here again I was able to export it as a KML file, which was really <laughs> great, this was going really well. <laughs> so, off to Denmark. Yes, so here I found 123 results. Well, actually, the first time I found 114 results, and the next time I found more and more, so they seem to be adding more data there, which is cool. Um, then came the first stumbling point, basically. I couldn't export any data. There, was, um, there wasn't any map data available for you to see online, but I sure couldn't export anything. I couldn't even export it as a um, CSV or anything. So then I tried the Netherlands. In um, the member of the Netherlands database, I found 113 results for Wongs and B. Um, it was great. And I tried out the German. I tried to find stuff in Germany too, but actually there I stumbled across the, the fact I couldn't actually find an, uh, an actual collective archaeological database to, to search for this sort of thing. So at this point I kind of decided to cut my losses and stop looking for archaeological data sets on this. So if you are sitting out there thinking, why didn't you just look here? Do come and tell me. I'd like to have a look wherever it is. Um, but I did get some spatial data collected that I could actually use, so what did I do with it? I uploaded it to Google Maps and thought, cool, now I can see the spread of all steps across Europe, across the UK and Sweden. <laughs> and, um, and actually, another thing that was quite cool was I thought, okay, well I know that there are some in Denmark, I know there are some in, in the Netherlands, I know that there are 
some in Germany too. I did find one that uh, that has some pole stamps. So I just put them in as, as points in Google Maps, and, and that at least gives me some idea of the spread. And this this map is available uh, publicly, so I'm going to go and check it out and put more stuff in. <laughs> anyway. Um, so what else could I do with the data? Well, the Portal Antiquity Scheme allowed me to download the C, um, CSV file, so, so I could put it into my favorite spreadsheet program, uh, and I could do some basic calculations. For example, the, the average weight of the Portal was 226 grams, and the average length is around 10 centimeters which is nice to know, I guess. <laughs> but uh, at this point, I'd just like to take a, a minute to think about how wonderful it could have been if I'd been able to access this sort of data across Europe with a lot of different data sets and all the, how easier I could have researched this subject more thoroughly. Um, so on to the next research test, which is knitted socks. Um, now, why knitted socks? You might be <laughs> Well, um, that's because I can knit them, and I'm very interested in them. And so it's it's research close to my my heart, and sometimes you really you just have to <laughs> do that. Or well, actually, it's close to my feet. So <laughs> yeah. So I didn't want to repeat the first research test looking for spatial data, so I decided instead to look at images, and. Um, a quick Google search kind of told me that there is images of knitted socks in DNA collections. So I went there to have a look and searched for uh, knit socks and received 156 results, 56 of them which actually had images. And, um, and now that we're talking about images, um, first of all, let me mention DNA actually have a very detailed image reuse policy, which is quite a cool thing. And sometimes they don't quite think about people like bloggers, or at least they don't want to say anything specifically about bloggers and what can they use the images. Um, it's more like you can use it for research or personal research or you know if you want to use it commercially you have to pay. It's yeah. <laughs> the in-betweens. Um, but anyway, on the subject of images, I also had a look at Flickr's, the comments, and the media comments for these top images, and did receive a few results, like this nice one here of the Red Cross women knitting socks for soldiers in World War One. This is from the State Library of New South Wales, and it's an image I probably never would have found if it wasn't for the fact that they put it in uh, Flickr's comments, because I never would have gone to their collections and looked separately through their collection for knit socks. So, um, so how do you, what I actually wanted to discuss was not so much what can you do with the images, because that, but more how do you get access to these images, to the searches for these images. And for that, Flickr is really quite cool in that they have the nice um, API Explorer, which allows you to, to create the API, um, or create the, the URL, to get the live feed version of a search or um, or any sort of information about their images. So for this example, I use the method flickr.photos.search to test to search for uh, text equals knit socks and in commons equals yes, and I get the resulting uh, list of images as XML. I promise this is the only picture. Of XML. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, um, and XML is great, you know, it's, yeah, it is human readable, it is. <laughs> um, yes. So, the, well, what I wanted to say here was it's not about getting the XML for the sake of the XML, however much I do like it to know. It's about getting the live access, the access to the live feed of this data. And they also have other ways, of uh, other formats, JSON and, yeah. Um, so to say that I wanted to reuse this list of images on on my blog, for example, I could uh, I, when I do so because of it because it's a web service, 
it will automatically update the list. If someone puts in a new image with lit socks, it will automatically update it um, on my, my blog post. So here's an example of on my blog I've taken, I've used the, the a Flickr uh, a plugin for my blog, a Flickr photo viewer, which actually uses the web service too. So if I went in and added more photos to this collection on Flickr, it would automatically be updated on my blog, which is cool. Um, so that was just basically an explanation for how do you use this data if if you're not familiar with XML. If XML just okay, I don't know what that says. Then you can use it in, with different plugins like this, and I think there'll be more and more of this sort of thing um, in the future. And if you are familiar with XML and XLT, well, then you know what to do with it. So uh, finally, I just wanted to quickly talk about text, which is the thing I'm doing at the moment. Um, so I'm, I would like to quickly search through some historic documents that mention knitted socks. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that I'm going to cheat a little bit here because I already know where I'm going to go looking. I'm going to go to the Vindolanda tablets online uh, and look at a quite well-known referenced knitted sock in a historic document. So I go to their, their index searcher and I search for the word socks and I get the, the tablet uh, 346 that you see here. Um, but actually in reality it doesn't actually say knitted socks. Okay. So in a minute it just says socks. It's a bit of cheating. But actually the rumor does go around the internet that it says knitted socks. Yeah. <laughs> just goes to show. Um, but the Vindalanda tab is online and um, does actually use web services for the whole website. Um, so the web, I know this because I, I built it. So the web service is used both to build a website and is served out so that other people can access it and, and use it, which I think is a good example of, of using, not just making the web service for others to use, because that's not really, um, we probably don't have money to, to do that sort of thing, but maybe integrate it as a way of how developing the, the web, the publication of your data, and then open it up to others too. So today I'm just going to quickly round off with what I'm doing right now. Uh, this is with the Gandhara manuscripts. Um, So uh, th with this, I'm doing similar work that I was doing on the Vindalanda tablets. That, um, in the sense that we like to republish the Buddhist manuscripts through TEI XML, which of course will give us the added benefits that we can do some things like link links between the text and the images. For example, with this part, it says uh, Buddhasa here, and uh, we'd like to be able to link this part of the image specifically to a part of the, the text. XML. So, um, other things we'd like to do is index searching and <coughs> interoperability between the manuscript in the publication itself. So, and on top of this, we would like to um, create a new editing environment that will enable the scholars who read these texts and who are spread out all over the world to edit the text collaboratively within the system. And last but not least, we'd also like to try um, to think ahead and figure out how this data set can be reused in the future by other researchers and, and other projects because the text will be uh, marked up as TEI XML so interoperability in that sense will be secured to an extent um, but I think it's quite important also to, to consider how can other people in the future use this data set and um, not just how can they download all the XML and, and do something with it, but how can they get access to to searching it and um, yeah on different levels. So I'm kind of hoping to, to develop a system with web services in mind because in that sense I can sit and do the publication view of it for the online for people who want to view it online, um, but other people could do an app for a tablet. 
Uh, we can do an editing environment that's on a tablet or uh, on a desktop, or but using the same data and the same um, web services that we've already developed. So. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me on this little research journey today. And uh, I actually I promised my uh, my colleague and I when I made this the presentation <laughs> earlier that I would conclude by telling you exactly what it is I want from your data because she was like, oh, so, so if we make it XML, then that's fine. And I was like, as much as I love XML, no, that's not quite enough. Um, it needs to be, well, I, I prefer if it is accessible as live feeds with adjustable URLs, uh, or at least, like in the Portability Scheme, uh, an export option for, for custom searches. So, the tests that I've done today, or the sort of appendixes for this, are going to be available on my blog with links to everything. And please feel free to catch me and comment on it or give me ideas for other places I could go and search. And I know there's a lot of data sets out there that are trying to make these things available and possibly already have. Um, but because I chose specific things to research, I probably haven't gotten to them in this round. And, but I'd love to know about them. Um, yeah. So. <laughs>